before we were getting ready here, I was doing a little hard work myself, but building, you know, I had the hammer and nails out. I was building something for the radio program. Uh, cause, uh, and you know what I forgot about hard work is that it's hard work. <laughs> well, guess what? Saturday I did. I went up what, to my farm. Do? I went up to my farm in Pennsylvania. I built two bridges that got washed out. I plowed, disked, fertilized, limed, uh, and planted a bunch of places up there on my farm. Well, you know, then see, we already got to the first question I was going to ask you, which is when we're running around the world and doing all the things you got to do in your job, how do you stay connected with what it means to do manual labor? And I guess that's the answer to that, because, you know, when you're sitting talking to somebody about how they want to cut Social Security or raise the retirement age, it's 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 a good bet they've got a desk job and they're not uh, driving nails or lifting lumber for a living all day, right? Or, work, or working in a coal mine or working on a building or driving a bus or doing anything uh, that is manual like that or where yeah. you're outdoors. Or on their feet all day, waiting tables, or you name it. So, yeah, so, so I guess that you know, and what that gets me to is, uh, look, when I grew up, I suspect we're more or less the same age. When I grew up, I grew up in Utica, New York, and there, everybody in my neighborhood had a good working class union job. The dads could raise a family, and you know, both men and women, of course, should be free to work, but. You could raise a decent uh, family, you know, live a nice lifestyle uh, with one income, and and you could uh, get a public education, and you could, uh, uh, you know, you could uh, raise your kids. And um, I guess my question for you is: We got a lot of people here. The technical term is structural employment, but we got a lot of people basically saying those days are gone forever. Everything about. And I guess my opening question for you is: Are those days gone forever? Well, those days will be gone forever if we continue with the same austerity policies of the last 30 years. Uh, if we change those policies, those days can yet be in front of us. We can produce good jobs. You can produce uh, jobs that will allow you to raise a family and actually achieve the American dream. They're doing it in Germany. They're doing it in Brazil. They're doing it in Australia. They're even doing it in Canada. It's a different set of policies. We, we have the austerity policies where they think you can cut your way uh, into uh, growing, which simply is not the case. And uh, as long as we have those policies, they'll continue. Now, the, the most defining fact, economic fact of the past generation, is that productivity has continued to go up and wages are flat. All of that money has literally been stolen uh, from workers and gone to the top 1% or 2% because of the policies in this country, because of the attacks on collective bargaining uh, and unionism, which helped share the benefits of those labors for generations and generations. Well, that gets us to the issue of the day that everybody seems to be it, inequality. Now, it, it, sometimes I feel like inequality is like the weather. You know, they used to say everybody talks about it. Nobody does anything about it. But but inequality, the, the idea that the rich are getting richer and richer while everybody else, the people look with jobs, the people looking for jobs, the people coming out of school are staying exactly where they were. Now, th that whole idea, there's a, there's a side of the argument that says, well, that's just the way nature works. That's just the way the world works. And those 30 years or so that we had post-war America that we were just talking about, uh, they're gone. And so I guess the answer uh, you know, to it is, number one, uh, if they're not gone, if we can replicate some of the things we did in that post-war era, well, you know, this, the other side of that argument that you hear people say is, ah, unions, they're not relevant. You know, they were they were good for their day. They were good for that that post-war era. But now it's all about outsourcing and robots and the automation. And nowadays, you're going to have to uh, get into the sharing economy and rent out your lawnmower in your second bedroom to get by because you're not going to be able to earn a decent living anymore. So what's the what's the relevance of unions nowadays? How do unions fit into the new world economy? Well, if you look at all the economies that have really succeeded and continue to grow and continue to have rising medium wages for their citizens, 
you'll notice that there's always a high percentage of those workers that are unionized. Now, let's take our country, for instance. From 1946 to 1973, productivity in this country doubled, and so did wages. And the interesting thing about that period of time was the, the bottom two quartiles, the people in the bottom two quartiles, their incomes were raising faster than the people at the top, so the, the inequality and wage gap was closing. It's not a, by some stretch of the imagination. Workers were represented 35 to 40% in unions at that time. So we drove wages for entire sectors. Uh, and non-union people got raises when we got raises. When we got additional benefits, uh, non-union people got them as well. From 73 to date, that productivity has continued up. But wages have been flat because there was a concerted attack on workers, on unions, on our ability to collectively bargain. Uh, and so workers have lost power uh, in this country. Multinational corporations have gained power. And look, if you buy the theory that it's a natural course of events, then you really don't believe much in the theory of democracy. Uh, because in democracy, everybody should get a fair share of, of what they produce. And that's what's happening in countries like Germany and France and Italy and Brazil and Australia and Canada. Those countries, their workers are doing much better because a higher percentage of them are in collective bargaining. Now, you could increase the minimum wage to a living wage so that people would do better. But that sort of straight jackets the system if you take the wage up very, very high. But if you use collective bargaining, where the people at that entity that know the entity the best can sit down as equals and get a fair share of what they produce, then you get a great result. That's called the American dream. And unless you're willing to give up on the American dream, you have to say that can be achieved yet again in this country. That's what we're all about. Raising wages for workers, all workers, union and non-union workers, so that an economy that is 72% driven by consumer spending can have the power to grow and reward everybody. Well, you're preaching to the converted on that one, and I couldn't agree with you more on every count. But yeah, I, and you you said something interesting there that uh, you know I, I'd like to return to a little bit, which is raising wages for union and non-union workers as well. You know, I think that there's a sense out there. I, I, you know, a lot of people I talk to say, "Oh, well, unions are not going to help me," or, or "Yeah, you got to pay your dues." I, I I don't get that much out of it, or you know, I don't know anybody who's on a union job anymore. So, I mean, one of the things that I've observed, but tell me if I'm wrong, is it seems to me like the union movement is is looking for and coming up with some ways to reach out to and help uh, workers who are not necessarily in a union right now and maybe haven't even given it some thought. But by helping them, I guess the idea is you help the whole economy. Or I'm thinking, for example, of fast food workers. Well, let's start with a couple of examples. First of all, at the front of every movement to raise the minimum wage has been the labor movement. That doesn't affect most of our members because our members make more than the minimum wage. But that's good for the country because it puts money in workers' pockets. That money creates demand. That demand creates jobs. So one way we do it is by, is by raising the minimum wage. It's by bringing a minimum level of benefits from Social Security to Medicare and Medicaid to health care to every American that's out there. The labor movement was at the front of every single one of those fights. Uh, and if you look at it, what we're doing right now, we're partnering with a, a lot of groups on the outside, progressive groups, to raise the wages uh, of all workers. Uh, the more we raise wages for everybody, uh, the better off uh, we are out there, whether they're union or non-union. And we're doing some pretty creative things. We're partnering with day laborers that are undocumented workers that hire out by the day. You see them standing on a corner somewhere. Uh, they get paid uh, a day's wages sometimes. Sometimes they get cheated out of those wages. We're helping those undocumented workers get what's rightfully theirs so that they're not misclassified and get paid half of what they're rightfully due or they don't have an employer that absconds. Uh, domestic workers, 
that have had a tough time because they're individually in each home. We're bringing them together. Uh, we've partnered with them. They're actually affiliated with the AFL-CIO. Car wash workers uh, on the West Coast uh, that couldn't even be, couldn't get protective gloves to keep the chemicals from burning the skin off of their hands. We've stepped in. Uh, we file claims for them. We help them. Uh, they're affiliated with us. Taxi cab drivers uh, in New York City that were pre predominantly immigrant workers were getting cheated out of what they were rightfully due. They're now part of us. We're working with that. So, uh, RJ, we're experimenting with different types of workers to help workers. And, you know, we're at the front uh, of the fight to bring citizenship to 11 million undocumented workers in the United States. Why? Well, there's there's a couple of reasons for it. One, because it's morally the right thing to do. We as a country are a country of immigrants, and we shouldn't be letting this group of immigrants uh, be mistreated and abused. Second of all, as long as they don't have the same rights as American workers, unscrupulous employers will use them to drive down the wages of every worker out there, union and non-union worker alike. And three, we found them to be a tremendous sense of innovation and hard work. Uh, bringing them into the real economy would be good for the economy. All of those come together, so we have a record to be proud of. We're doing more to raise the wages of others uh, than we've ever done before, and we'll continue doing that until every American gets a fair share, gets exactly what they're entitled to, gets paid for overtime, gets paid for all the work that they do, and their standard of living is rising. The other one, of course, you said is uh, fast food workers that are fed up with living under unbearable conditions, hot. They, they jerk them around on schedules so they can never plan a life. Uh, they move them in and out, and we're working with them to try to get a living wage. Or Walmart, uh, trying to get a minimum of $25,000 for every Walmart worker out there. If we do that, Every worker in this country will benefit. And we won't be spending so much on uh, assistance for them because they're not make, making enough to get by and the government's got to step in. So I'm with you on that too. And I guess, but I guess where it goes is you're, it sounds like a different kind of, it, not your father's union movement, if you will. I'm, I'm old and I come from a union family, but I, I also remember the days you used the word progressive and and since you already have an idea how old I am, I was one of those long-haired student demonstrators who uh, was getting beaten up by George Meany's guys back in the uh, Vietnam day. Well, I wasn't because I could run faster. I wasn't bigger, but I could run faster. But, um, you know, there was a day when the union movement and the whole idea of progressive, whatever word you want to use, populism is coming up now as a term, uh, new populism, but whatever you want to call it, there was a day when their perception was you had your union card, you were in the union, you were on one side of the fence, everybody else was outside. Now, it sounds like what you're saying is this is a broad set of alliances for everybody who works for a living, or that that's something closer to that. Am I, am I on to something? Am I getting close? You know, let me go back and say this is back to the future, because let me take you back to my union. I came out of the United Mine Workers. I'm a third generation miner. Uh, we were formed in 1890. At our first, very first convention in 1890 in Columbus, we adopted a resolution in our convention, our constitution, that said that it prohibited discrimination based on race, color, creed, or national origin. We elected two African American males uh, to our first executive board, one from Tennessee and one from Wheeling, West Virginia. We never had a Jim Crow local in the mine workers. And so we're mm. going back to those roots where we were part of the community and the community was part of us, where we weren't just raising wages for our for union members, but it was good for us to raise wages for the entire community so we could fund schools, so we could fund health care, so we could have old age pensions for everybody, like Social Security, which provides a minimum uh, of, of, of benefits and securities for every American out there. We were at the front of those fights, and now that's where we're back to. We're inviting the communities to come in. In fact, uh, six months before our last convention, which was September of last year, uh, RJ, we invited progressive groups to come in and be part of our committees and said, look, there's a problem out there. Let's 
plan together, let's educate together, let's mobilize together, and let's try to correct it together. We brought them in. They were voting members of our committees. They were at our convention. They participated fully in the convention. And since then, we're planning together, mobilizing together, educating together, and reaching out to the community to say, look, none of the progressive groups out there are big enough to do it alone. But all of us together represent the vast majority of Americans. Let us stick together and create an economy that really does work for everyone, not just the top 1%. Well, you know, and you know, this, this kind of approach, it's very popular, as you well know, because you see you commissioned a lot of the polling that shows that people across the political spectrum, Republicans, Democrats, even Tea Partiers agree with a lot of this agenda. They're just, ha it hasn't been galvanized or organized for them. And, and to that end, um, if I remember correctly, I mean, that gets us to the whole issue of where uh, electoral politics fits in all this. And if, if I remember correctly, uh, I read recently or heard recently that you were encouraging Elizabeth Warren to get into the presidential race. Is that true? <laughs> well, I, I don't know that I encouraged Elizabeth. What I was asked uh, about Elizabeth Warren and about the presidency, and I said she would be the prototype president, someone who really does care about people and has the strong enough convictions of her values to stay with them and fight for them after she got elected. Uh, I, I really admire Elizabeth because she didn't change one iota during her campaign or after her campaign. She said what she stood for on day one. She got elected on that, which it, it is great politics in this country. And then she fought for those same things. Now, you know, the, the Supreme Court rulings that, that put the system awash in money can be addressed one of two ways. And I wrote an op-ed piece on this, RJ. Democrats and Republicans can go out and uh, uh, pan for money at, at the same trough. Or one of them can say, I'm going to stand for the values of working people and actually fight for them and watch people come to them. That's good electoral politics in this country because the vast majority of people believe that having a good job and a voice on the job and having Social Security and health care for everybody and the right to a vacation, the right to send your kid to college, instead of, instead of us paying billions and billions of dollars in subsidies to corporations, we could be sending every kid in this country to college free like they do in other countries. That's good politics. That makes sense. And that's the values that we stand for and the vast majority of Americans stand for. And we're going to continue to fight for those. I'm not ashamed of it. I make no excuses, and I will never make excuses for standing up for workers like that. Well, you know, I wrote a piece pointing on the economics of, uh, of giving everybody free college education, which I'm all for. Remember the GI Bill. A lot of guys went to, and, and, and some women, it was mostly guys at, at that day, went to college on the GI Bill, and they contributed to the growth of the economy, too. So I did a piece on the economics of it. We could pay for it if we closed uh, tax loopholes. But, uh, you know, I guess what we're up against is, and I'll admit I was wrong. I love Elizabeth Warren. I was wrong. I had to pay up because I said, you know, she'll get in, she'll be a Democrat, she'll have to contend for money, just as you were saying, at the same corporate trough, she'll have to blunt her message, and man, was I wrong. And so I guess my question is, where do we find another dozen like her, you know, uh, and, and move uh, electoral politics away from centrist, uh, you know, third way, uh, going for corporate money that way, and hard right Republican going for money that way? How do we get uh, where do unions fit into this? Where is union? Where can the union movement help with this? Well, well, first of all, there's more than just Elizabeth that are that same type of politician. Sherrod Brown's there, uh, Jeff Markley. There are a number uh, of people in the House and the Senate that have never, you know, wavered from what they stood for. George Miller, uh, for instance. But there are there are there are a number of them there. It's a small cater that we really need to uh, to foster and and to. Uh, to encourage and then defend. What, what we're doing is changing the way that we do politics, RJ. We, we used to get our political machine geared up 
uh, seven, eight months before an election. And then on election night, we'd go celebrate that we got someone elected. Uh, but we had no way to hold them accountable out thereafter. Right now, we're keeping our political uh, mechanism in place so that the day after election day, we start growing it to get it bigger each time, not killing it and then growing it back, killing it, growing it back. We're going to keep growing it, and we'll use that mechanism to hold people accountable so that if, in fact, you say uh, that you stand for workers, we're going to make sure you stand for workers. And if you don't, every one of your constituents are going to know, not just union folks, but everybody out there. The other thing that we're doing, RJ, that I'm really excited about uh, is we started a thing called Common Sense Economics. It's an analysis of how the policies of the last 30 years actually built this box around workers and around the country. Uh, and then it gives the policy prescriptions uh, uh, as a way out. Uh, and uh, we worked with uh, Jacob Hacker uh, to mm -hmm. work on those policy prescriptions. And they come in a couple of different buckets. One bucket is democracy itself. If we allow uh, the top 1% to get stronger and stronger and stronger and spend unlimited amounts, there comes a tipping point where they will continue to make the rules and control the system uh, forever. And that's not the way democracy was intended uh, to be exercised. Uh, so one bucket is fighting for democracy, stopping these stupid rules that make it harder to vote and make it easier to vote. One thing that we'll be pushing for is universal res uh, registration. When you're born, you're registered, and you're registered for life. You don't have to jump through hoops every couple of years uh, to be able to vote. Uh, the second thing is the actual policy descriptions. To get rid of uh, the old austerity politics, uh, and neoliberalism that we've exported from this country for the last uh, 30 years and has resulted in uh, the fiascos that we've seen, uh, the near meltdown of the economy and the 1% growing by leaps and bounds while everybody else uh, is stagnant or even worse, going in the opposite direction. We're going to take that out. We're going to train that train trainers, workers, so that they can go talk to workers. Union workers, non-union workers, our goal is to talk uh, to a couple of million non-union workers and give them that analysis and the policy prescriptions and continue to build on that and go down the ballot to, to local people, county commissioners, mayors, uh, and have them have the same understanding of the economy so people begin to talk about what is possible with the economy, not what isn't possible. Because they have us believing right now that we really can't give an education to kids. We don't have the money. We can't do this. We don't have the money. Yet, every time it comes time for multinationals or the banks or everybody else to get bailed out, we find the money. All we have to do is change a few loopholes, the territorial taxation system that allows a hundreds of billions of dollars to escape, bring it back in, and you'll be able to give people good jobs, build good infrastructure, make the country uh, more competitive in the process, and at the same time, create a tax base that allows schools to prosper and communities to prosper. Well, and they'll tell you that the corporations can't afford to bring those, repatriate those offshore taxes, even though their profits are at record levels. So, it all sounds good to me, but I'll t I, I, it brings up. I know you. I know you. You're pressed for time, but it brings up another question, which is: You just got back from meeting with your colleagues from all around the world, and is there a tension there in that conversation between uh, what what you're doing for American workers and the, and these lousy trade deals they keep trying to push on us, and maybe some of the other unions saying elsewhere in the world saying, "Well, we could use those jobs." No, uh, there, everybody understands that if you, if the idea of a trade agreement is to steal jobs from the other partner, you're going to get your turn in the barrel. In fact, it was quite the opposite. Uh, I, I met uh, and we did a, a, a long series of negotiations and meetings with the ETUC, the European Trade Union uh, Congress. Uh, and uh, we've agreed on a set of principles for the trade agreement between the U.S. Uh, and, and Europe. 
Uh, one of those principles is doing away with the investor state dispute settlement mechanism uh, that allows uh, mm. a government, uh, it threatens the, the ability of governments to respond to public needs by placing private profit on the same level as a general welfare. It allows corporations and banks and other corporate investors to circumvent domestic, legislative, regulatory, and the judicial processes. We did that, but several other several other things we have agreed to as well. We have this series of principles that we've agreed to. If that agreement doesn't have those principles in it, then trade union movements in Europe and the United States will oppose that, that trade that treaty. And I think collectively we'll be able to defeat a treaty that is modeled on the old NAFTA model uh, and all of those uh, along the same line. So everybody understands what's out there and that these policies, the austerity policies, aren't working. I talked to workers from Greece. Uh, oh, boy. 27% uh, uh, unemployment. Among youth, it's 40-some percent. They keep cutting and cutting and cutting. Why are they doing that? They know it doesn't help. It, it's to placate the bond market. It's to have, so the world, WTO, the World Trade Organization, the, the World Bank, the IMF, our Inter International Monetary Fund, and those organizations still have the old neoliberalism that says unless you cut and you do away with the social safety net and you lower the wages uh, of your workers, we won't lend you the money. That's the fight that we're fighting right now, and we're doing it collectively. Uh, it doesn't – look, when we sign an agreement with Mexico, the Mexican workers aren't our enemy. They're trying to make a living just like we are. The enemy is the high investment people who take advantage of that to, to abuse workers on both sides of the border and lower the standard of living of people on both sides of the border. We want an agreement that raises the standard of living, and we're willing to fight for that. Well, that makes a lot of sense to me, particularly because well-paid American workers can buy imported goods better than uh, than poorly paid American workers. And in the end, if the deal is only designed to exploit those workers in other countries, nobody's going to win. We're going to have more Bangladesh disasters and all of that. So that may. I, and the last question: I know you got to go. But last year, I was just reading before this call uh, the AFL-CIO annual report of deaths on the job, death on the job. And what jumped out at me, we, we have 50,000 estimated deaths from, uh, from occupational illness. We had something like 4,300, 4,400 uh, deaths on the job itself. We had 3,000 deaths in 9-11. And we changed the way we live because we, we said rightfully that every human life is sacred. What do we do to change the attitude that so many people, particularly on the business side, seem to have, which is, well, 4,300 isn't too bad, 50,000 50, isn't too bad. These are our, our mothers and fathers, our sisters and brothers, our neighbors. What do we do to, to get people to pay attention to those deaths? Well, first of all, let me talk about my personal experience, RJ. Uh, every male in my family has died from black lung from the coal mine. Both my grandfathers, my dad, both of his brothers, several of my uncles and several of my cousins have died from black lung. Now, we kill every day. Seven workers die from asbestosis. And here's the question that I ask uh, politicians of all stripes, including the, the uh, president, uh, the administration. If terrorists were killing seven workers every day in the United States, how many days would it be before the American public demanded action to stop it? There's no difference between a terrorist killing you and an occupational disease killing you. These are things that can be stopped. We, they die, people in this country die by ones and twos every day, and no one notices. It's only when you have a major disaster, a coal mine explodes, and you have people trapped that people say, oh, we have to do something about health and safety. It's, it's a constant job to educate them, the American public, and mobilize them and get them sensitive to the fact that workers are dying every day instantly 
and they're dying in pieces because of occupational diseases, and that is unacceptable. They are dying for profit. Profit can be put slightly aside, create self safe working places that are more productive and create more profit in the long run for, for employers. But it's going to take all of us saying every day, two workers just died. One worker died here. One, one construction worker fell. A truck driver died. Those are needless deaths that we have to make people understand uh, and, and get rid of the desensitization that we've created in this country about workers dying in ones and twos like it's some act of God or it's part of the job. It, it doesn't have to be that way. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll make you a deal right here. If, if, if someone in your shop is, it can keep track of those, we'll, do, uh, we'll, we'll speak their names every week, just like they do with, with the people who give their sacrifice their lives in combat. We will name them every week on this show. I'll tell you what, what I'll do. It? I'll give you. I'll do it my best to identify those people and get the names in your hands uh, on a regular basis, uh, so that people out there will actually know that there's a face, there's a family. That's a mother. It's a dad. It's a brother. It's a sister. It's an aunt. It's an uncle. It's a neighbor. It's a friend. Uh, it is somebody whose life has just been terminated, and their family has been cut short of the enjoyment of that family. That's what we have to do. Make sure that it's not a statistic, but it's people that are dying. And we'll work with we, you every way we can. I appreciate the offer, and I take you up on it. It's a deal. We got a deal. And with that, I know you've got a lot to do, so I'm, I, I, I will let you go with my great thanks, and I hope you'll join us again sometime, President Richard Trumpka, the FLCIO. RJ, you invite me back, and I'll be on. Good luck. Thank Good you.